welcome to New Consciousness Review. My name is Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Maureen St. Germain. She's a best-selling author, musician, and producer of over 15 guided meditation CDs. She has taught workshops for almost 20 years and is especially well-known for her book, Beyond the Flower of Life, about the Merkaba meditation and higher self-connection, which Maureen has been teaching since 1994. As a channel, she was given direct access to the Akashic Records in 2003. She's considered the practical mystic, and Maureen's latest book, Be a Genie, shares the step-by-step practical tools and practices based on the laws of quantum physics and sacred geometry, the same rules that enabled her and her students worldwide to create a life filled with love, success, and happiness. And in fact, that's the tagline of her book, Be a Genie, Create Love, Success, and Happiness. Welcome, Maureen. I'm so delighted you could join us. Thank you. Thank you for having having me, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Now, your book is positioned at the intersection of intuition, quantum physics, and sacred geometry. What inspired this integration of science and mysticism? I worked in the corporate world for a long time, supporting my family. And I felt very strongly that even though I had really good guidance and intuition and a strong spiritual path, it was all in the closet. And I felt that if the corporate world, people who think logically and use the elements of logic and reasoning, if they could be shown a way that proved this esoteric stuff was true and real, then they would be able to use it too. That was my motivation. Wow. And what brought you out of the closet? I got fired one too many times. (laughs) (laughs) It's very funny because I always had very high-level jobs. I didn't have any trouble getting high-level jobs. I was always well-liked. But I was also very frank. And um, for most of the last 10 years of of my corporate world, I worked with the board of directors. And in most cases, the board would love me, but then the staff would be mad because they would be exposed. You know, there would be something that would go down and I I would call them out. Uh So um, it was always a little bit of politics involved. I um, I tended to uh, go along with politics up until a point, and then I'd just say, you know what, enough already. So I enjoyed my corporate life very much, and I, I, like I said, I have fabulous reviews and fabulous stories. But I reached a point where I actually said at the altar one day, I've made 20000 this year doing seminars part-time, still holding on to my corporate job. If I can make that much money... Part time. I wonder what I would do if I were working full time at this. And so I consciously said, I'm ready to let go. And, and 30 days later, I was offered a buyout and a package, which I took. Hmm. And that well, began the process. Well, so. one, one thought comes to me uh, immediately, which is, if you're working in a corporation, don't mess with the psychic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, it's so funny that you say that. Um, <laughs> I had been the CEO for most of that 10 years, but the last job I held, I was in a position as um, a lobbyist for the phone companies. And my boss would say to me, I don't want to know uh, what you what your intuition is on this, I want you to prove it to me. And it was so interesting because I never, ever used that word. He was the one who was always throwing it in my face. Huh. But obviously he had enough intuition to know that I was using mine. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, this is one of my my pet things is getting people to connect to their intuition. And I was just so delighted to to dive into your book, which we will get into very, very shortly. But I'm, I'm just curious, you wrote this genie book almost 20 years ago. Why are you releasing it now? 
Well, as a manifester, one of the things that I set out to do was to get a book agent, which I did. And then I wanted a, a two book deal or better. And I got a three book deal with Hampton Roads. Those are the people that publish Conversations with God. Mm. And then Hampton Roads ran into some money problems. And the investors that were going to come in when they signed me didn't. And six months after they signed on the dotted line and I had already submitted the manuscripts and I was still waiting for my advance checks, I get a phone call from the then CEO who says, we're not going to do your books. Hmm. So they sat on the shelf for a little while and I uh, kept checking in. And the obvious answer was, you need rewrites. Because if this book was going to be such a fabulous bestseller, it wasn't good enough. You know, Mm -hmm. the fastest way for a product to fail is good marketing and have it be a lousy product because now everybody's talking how bad it is. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the drawing board and I'll bet you that book got rewritten at least 15 more times. And in the process, you know, I built a different kind of a network and grew my other offerings and published a different book first and then followed with this one. And I am so happy that I did that. And I'm so happy that book didn't go out when I wanted it to, when I thought it was ready uh, because it wasn't ready. And, you know. Well, you know, I, I might venture to suggest that not only was the book not ready, but the mass consciousness was not ready for it. I, I think true. I think this um, is just a, a great opening of consciousness at this time. And in fact, um, I would say that the movie and and then the book, The Secret was one of the keys that kind of unlocked that. Now, your book has, you know, a certain a certain similarity to The Secret in that you both deal with manifestation. How is your book different? I'm glad you said that. When The Secret first came out, my first thought was, oh, I want to be the one to break that to, you know, humanity. And then I thought, you know what, they're doing a lot of the hard work for me. And... uh How is my book different? Most of the people who you studied both tell me that my book gives them the practical tools. The secret, you know, like cracks open the the walnut, so to speak. But what do we do with the walnut meat once we've got it? And that's what my book's all about. How to really apply the principles, how to use them proactively. I used to call myself the Betty Crocker of manifestation or spirituality. But then I decided, well, that's dating me. (laughs) <laughs> so then I decided I'd go with uh, uh, another well-known personality, but she went to jail. <laughs> so then I decided I, I better stop being anybody else but me. Uh-huh. And so that's why uh, the, the whole nickname of being a practical mystic kind of stuck. Well, I would take it a step further, actually, because... The secret from memory, it's been a while now since I read it or watched the movie, but that tended to focus primarily on the mystical, primarily on, you know, acquiring stuff. Whereas I get the feeling from your book that it um, it, it goes further into the how-to. It has some original um, uh, processes that we, we can get into in a bit. But it also is very deeply rooted in life lessons. There's, there's a, a depth and a humanity to your book, which, which I applaud. And I think that that goes beyond um, what The Secret was able to accomplish. But, you know, at, at the time, I think The Secret was the right book for that time. Anyway, moving on. Um, You say that being a mystic helped you to figure out the genie system, which is the title of your book. What, What is this genie system? The genie system is based on a principle that there's a mathematical formula that I've labeled, given the name, the Phoenix Sequence, that allows you to see mathematically or numerically how you can start with two numbers that are totally unrelated and add them together. And in the course of adding them together nine times, that last pairing 
divided produces this magic number known as phi. And phi is what I call source code for the universe because it's found in the relationship between the leaves of a plant and the stem. It's found in the relationship between the length of your chin to your forehead and your third eye. It's found in the length of the little finger to the wrist. It's found in the relationship of the DNA. And this sequence is so common and uh, found everywhere that people have heard of, quote, the Fibonacci sequence. But the Phoenix sequence is any two numbers added together will produce phi, this magic ratio. And, you know, when I, when I explain it to people, I say everybody remembers hearing about pi. And that's the relationship between the radius of a circle and the circumference, or the radius and the area. And no matter whether the circle's big or little, you always need pi to figure out the circumference. So people go, yeah, yeah, I, I did learn that. I might not remember what pi is, but they remember that concept that pi is the relationship that exists between that circle and its radius. So this magic number phi is also a relationship. In other words, it's built on a contrast between two numbers. It doesn't exist alone. And it is this contrast of two numbers that is produced when you hold any two things together long enough, it will produce phi. Now, it's kind of hard to see how that fits until I give you a storyline and you say, oh, now I get it. So imagine that a low number is somebody who has a dream that they're not actualizing it. And then this high number is the uh, outcome after they've achieved that high uh, dream. And then take an example of a woman, a true story of a woman who was in a class I had in Atlanta. And she stood in front of the whole class and said, I want to own a horse rescue farm. Now, I said to her, and what do you do now? And she said, I work as a clerk in a law firm. So here she was a city girl. She saw herself owning a horse rescue farm. And I remember even thinking at the time, oh, my word, she is really reaching for the stars here. But I did the process with her. And a year later, she sends me an email and it goes like this. Dear Maureen, that genie system really works. I got hitched. Now, I think that's a very cute way of saying that you got married and it's very clever coming from a horsewoman. The next sentence she says is the man I married had started a business selling organic feed, making and selling organic feed to, for horses. <laughs> <clears throat> and we have a farm. Uh, and how far do you think she is from having that rescue farm? Not very far. And that was only one year's time. Wow. So it, it sounds like uh, you've been doing this in workshops uh, all over the world. Can anyone uh, achieve these results? I think so. And, and the fabulous part about it is you don't have to even believe in the process or believe in the steps. What you have to do is follow the steps. And it's kind of like acting. You fake it till you make it. So, um, you know, if there was if there was something that that you wanted to manifest that you were willing to play with me on the air, I would show you what I mean. It's very it's a very interesting concept. Is yeah. something you want to manifest <laughs> you'd be willing to share. How about sales for my new book? Okay. Bestseller status. OK. And what's the name of your new book? Do you know the name? Um, it's actually published already. It's out okay. there. It's called What Wags the World? Tales okay. of Conscious Awakening. What Wags the World? Now, what would prove that you already have a bestseller? Um, it would be reflected in my bank account. Not necessarily. Oh. You could win a lottery. Someone could hand you money. Oh, that's true. Um, I guess, uh, think of a, think of an example that proves that your book is a bestseller. And the other thing is, what is it that you want your book to do? It isn't just be a bestseller, is it? No, it's, it's getting out there and really just spreading these tales of conscious awakening. So people will recognize themselves in it. Okay. And so you want to help people. I want to help people. Yeah. All right. Same so thing you do. Is, yeah. 
Yeah, but it's important to say it because it's different than just having money in the bank. Because you would do it whether you had money in the bank or not. You'd find a way. Obviously, I've done it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so let's go back. Name an event, and this is very funny because those people who are listening can probably tell you the answer to this already, and this happens with everyone, by the way. The person who's being asked the question can't see it, and everybody else can see the elephant in the room. It's, it's just hilarious. So what is it? Name an event that proves your book is a bestseller and it has really helped people. Um, I would be invited on Oprah. There you go. And if you were already on Oprah... That's a done deal. You've done the show. Now you're going to have a real-time conversation with someone who you're going to tell your story to. Maybe they don't watch Oprah. Maybe they're, you know, like a family member or somebody who believes in you, but, you know, they're not part of that scene. Mm -hmm. They don't really know. And you're going to tell them about this event. Who would it be? Somebody that supports you. Oh, probably one of my daughters. All right. And so you have to pick one. Okay. The skeptical one. All right. So give her a fictitious name if you want to keep her privacy. I don't care, but you have to have a name to work with already. Okay. So what name are you going to use? Uh, We'll just call her Debbie. Okay. So you're having a conversation with Debbie, and is it going to be in person or is it going to be over the phone? Phone. And what is she likely to say? How's it going, Mom? Or I heard uh, you've been doing some important interviews or something like that. What would she Uh say? Um, uh, Probably, well, there's one born every minute, but, you know, this is a big one, so congratulations. Okay, so that's how she would put it, or you just added that? How does she say it to you? Put it in Uh, present tense. In the moment. You've already been on Oprah. Well, Mom? And you're going to have a conversation about it. Oh, she doesn't know it. Oh, okay. It's not Uh, her. Hi, how are you? How's work? Um, And she tells you how's her work. And and she says to you, how's work? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, so she asks you, how's your work? Or how's the book coming? How's the book coming? And I would say, No, no, well, not I would say, I say, present tense. Oh, and I say, well, I was just on Oprah. This is probably the biggest thing ever for a, uh, a book. You know, it's a kind of a, um, really a mark of having arrived uh, at a certain level in not only in the, the spiritual world, but in the the. The big, greater, wide world. Yay! She would know who Oprah is. So you is there anyone on the planet who it. doesn't? Yes, but there are people who don't follow Oprah. So oh, she doesn't different. follow. I'm sure she doesn't okay. follow. But so you don't have to Oprah. educate her on who Oprah is or how big it is. All you have to do is say, uh, honey, I was on Oprah. Mm-hmm. You hear how that's different? You wouldn't give her this song and dance about how wonderful Oprah is. You would... She would say, how's your book going? And you would say very clearly, you be your daughter and I'll show you what I mean. Okay. So, so how's your work coming, Mom? Hi, Mom. How's your work coming? How's the book? The book is doing fabulously since I was on Oprah. Wow. Now, she's going to say, what? You were on Oprah? You've got to be kidding me. Really? I see. We're pulling out all the dramatic stops. Got it. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Now, as we play, here's what I want you to hear. Your daughter is the doubting Thomas of the family or of of the girls, whatever. She's not going to like it when you announce her that you've been on Oprah. So she's going to challenge it. And she's going to challenge it in a sweet way. That's why it's like, what? You've got to be kidding me. Really? And because she doesn't, she's like trying to process it while she's talking because Mm -hmm. it's like, oh my God, my mother was on Oprah. (laughs) You see where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. When you giggle, that's the validation because when you, when you observe her processing that kind of news, it's suddenly real. 
because you giggled, you felt, yeah, yeah, honey, it's true. <laughs> and 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 you, you you hear how I did that, how I played you again? Yeah, honey, it's true. It's uh-huh. like you're gonna have to accept it, and and not in a not in a way that like you have to believe it. You just have to accept it. It's uh-huh. so so different. There's energy in it, and and she's just going to say, well, you just get out of town. So amazing. Good for you. Good on you. And she's still going to be processing. She'll probably be processing it for months. Uh And that's all right. But that's the reaction you're looking for. And that reaction feels real. That reaction is exactly what we do when we create a movie of the mind. We base it on already having had the experience that defines the outcome. So we define the outcome as you are on Oprah, your book's doing well, it's helping people. And proof of that is that you got invited on Oprah. And now that you already appeared on Oprah and it's a done deal, now you're telling your daughter, yeah, you're just going to have to accept it. And it's, it's done in such a way that you know in the tone that you're not being judgmental. You're just being kind of sweet teasing. And that's how it would come across. And that's how your communication between her would be. So what you do is you run this movie of the mind where you hear yourself saying these kinds of things to her and you hear her outrage. Again, her outrage is expressed in a kind, sweet way, but it still expresses her shock and disbelief because she doesn't want to believe that this could possibly be that mainstream. She might even make a comment like, oh, well, Oprah's gone off the deep end then or something. And you would laugh depending Mm -hmm. upon how she you know, talks to you and, and where her personality is. But I usually tune into all of this when I ask people to do this. And I'm pretty sure I've, I've emulated your daughter pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what happens is you run this visual of you having this conversation. Now, here's why this works. When we create a manifestation and we just put it in our head as a possibility, you know, I could fail, but I could also do really well. But when you have this conversation about the fact that the book is already doing very well and it's helping people, what happens is the universe goes, oh, oh, then it's already a success. Done deal. There's all kinds of studies. And here's one. There was a study done in Russia of basketball players. Three groups of basketball players were asked to practice an extra 30 minutes. First group did real time practice at the foul line shooting hoops. Second group pretended they were at the foul line practicing shooting hoops. And the third group didn't have to do anything for that half an hour. First group increased their game 25%. Their percentage points went up 25%. Third group, no increase. But the middle group, 24%. The mind cannot tell the difference between an observed reality and an experienced reality in the head and produces the same results for you. So this is why going to what I call the after event, the outcome that proves your heart's desire is history, produces the outcome. And it's the same thing as these two numbers. And those of you who are listening in the audience, imagine, pick a number like three and a number like five and add those two numbers together or six and 20. It doesn't matter. And then let's say we start with six and 20. Then the next number is 26. The next number is 46. And then the next number is uh, 70, whatever, 70 something. And so you keep adding the last sum to the previous digit until you've done it 10 times. And you take the last two numbers and no matter what two numbers you start with, you take those last two numbers and divide them and you will always get 1.618. Always, always, always. 1.618 is the numerical representation of phi representing that magic ratio of phi. Now, what's really interesting is I believe that creation, as a mystic, I believe that creation is made up of two kinds of creation. One is what we call linear, and the other is what I call nonlinear or dynamic. And what I mean by that is it relies on a relationship to produce something. So pi or phi do not exist without the parent 
two numbers that are divided. You can't have 3.17 dot, dot, dot without knowing what those two earlier numbers are. And this is the way it is in this kind of a, uh, expression. So it turns out mathematically that you can define everything that's known in either a straight number, a solid number that has a definable quantity, or through a number that has a quantity that continues to adjust and flux, depending upon how many decimal places you want to go out, how much refinement you want, and that's the numbers that are created with ratios. Those numbers are known as constants because they constantly show up. Pi constantly shows up between a circle's radius and its circumference. Phi constantly shows up on the human body, on the plant kingdom, on the relationship between Venus, Mercury, and the sun. And it's also found in all the great buildings, the Parthenon, the Great Pyramid. It's found throughout nature and organic and inorganic. So this relationship exists. And what we're doing is when we pay attention, we're tapping into that relationship to use phi to ride the rainbow to our outcome. Now, the interesting thing is, once you understand this mathematically, then you begin to comprehend why it's so important not to let side issues inter intersect or interfere with your outcome. So let's say you're trying to manifest a beloved, and someone says to you, well, you know, there's not that many good guys out there. Your response is, I only need one. You don't let that feedback change your visual of yourself. Mm. I, I thought there was a great um, table in your book where you showed uh, it was talking about self-talk and you showed all the negative statements that you, you know, could could make about a situation. And then you showed how to reframe them into a positive uh, statement. Yes, those tables are so much fun because people, uh, you know, don't. It's so interesting to me because some of these things just were so automatic to me that. I didn't realize that other people didn't have the ability to just do that, you know. So it was surprising to me to uh, real to recognize that people would benefit from looking at a table like that and going, "Oh yeah, I can use that." And a classic example is, um, "You can't do that," you know. Someone tells you, you you're going to manifest something. Like, well, you can't do that. And one of my favorite responses is, is to say my grandma, my dad, my mom, somebody that you treasured in your life told me I can do anything I want. And, oh, by the way, so can you. Mm -hmm. Because usually the person that says you can't do that mm -hmm. would really like to do it themselves. Yeah. yeah. And they're announcing it because that's their belief for themselves as well. The other, the other thing that I liked about these negative statements is how you said – to observe them, to let them go, but to recycle the energy behind them for really your own manifestation. Um, how do you ex explain to our listeners how you do that? Well, this is a very, uh, very powerful tool. First of all, we all have fears and we all have, you know, negative statements that come in. Sometimes the negative statements have validity. Sometimes they don't. And if they have no validity, you're just going to dismiss them. But sometimes they come in from somebody you love and trust, like a, a parent or a spouse or a, a, you know, a good friend. And it's a little harder to dismiss it because you're looking at the source and they always give you good advice. So how do you dismiss it? And you have to recognize that once in a while you're going to get a Trojan horse, a, a pretend piece of feedback that isn't valid for you. And you just have to decide, is this valid for me or not? You know, and, and the story about the ham, you know, why do we cut the ham? And it keeps going back to the grandma. And we finally get to the last grandma, great, great grandma. And she says, well, because the pan wasn't big enough. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to the idea of fear, I'd like to touch on that because this is a really important concept. I actually saw my fear as little, little kind of beings that were trying to tell me something. So I began to talk with this energy and feel it and, and begin to understand it. And what I learned is that fear is a messenger. Fear is always a messenger. And it's telling you one of two things. It's either telling you to change your belief or to change your behavior. 
So if I say I want to lose weight, but you catch me eating bonbons, obviously we need to change my behavior. If I believe that sex outside of marriage is wrong and I catch me fooling around with somebody, I got to change my belief system or quit screwing around. <laughs> now, what's interesting is a lot of people hold beliefs and act outside of them. And when you hear people and they say things that aren't true, I'll give you an example. I, I roomed with a person on my recent trip to Europe, and my friend spent a lot of money buying some wonderful clothes. She, she's a great shopper. She knows how to power shop. She came back. She had so much stuff. She had to get another suitcase. On the last day, we arrived, and I said, well, did you want to take a bath? And she says, I can't take a bath because I, I don't have any clean clothes to put on. And I looked at her, and I said, um, excuse me, you got a <laughs> suitcase full of clean clothes. In her mind, she wasn't going to put on the clean clothes, so she got home. They were for some special whatever. But she announced that she couldn't take a bath because she didn't have any clean clothes. She didn't have any clean travel clothes. So it's so interesting. We don't notice that our language is, is reflecting what we really hold to be true. So one of the things I tell people is stop saying I have to. Stop saying I need to. And start saying I choose. Blah, blah, blah. In that way, we stay in our power. It also means you stop doing stuff that implies something else. For example, at the buffet, you just take what you need. In the hotels, you don't take the extra shampoo and soap that you're not going to use or you haven't used so far. And you say, I have enough. I don't need any more. And what that tells the universe is make sure she has what she needs when she needs it. But she doesn't need to have extra because you have total comp confidence in your ability to manifest what you need when you need it. And what happens is the energy shifts. When we talk about paying bills, and this is another classic example, I ask people to tell me what the difference is between people who have resources and have money and how they pay their bills and people who live from week to week. And the answer is people who live from week to week <clears throat> pay their bills when they get paid. But people who have plenty of resources, pay their bills when they want to. Mm -hmm. So the energy is different. The energy is proactive instead of reactive. Now extend that out and let's say um, people, at one time I was really, really broke. I was so broke that I had to put money into envelopes every week and say, this is my gas money, this is my food money, this is the kids allowance money because I, I, it, was, it was like crazy, it was so tough. And so I started setting money aside until I had enough money to make a $100 bill. And then I put that $100 bill in a special place in my wallet. And that $100 bill was so that I could say, I can afford it. How many times have people looked at something in the store? Maybe they're shopping. Maybe they're, you know, in the store for one thing and they see something else that they're attracted to. And they look, oh, I can't afford that. And they walk away. What if you could look at something that you really like and say, you know, this is a beautiful black skirt. I tried it on, it looks great, but I already have two other black skirts. Do I really want another one? Will I use it? I've got that hundred dollar bill. I can break it if I need to. You know what? I think I'll pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a choice, choice. Mm -hmm. instead of I can't afford it. It changes the energy. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is all about. It's about deciding that you are the central power of you. And also deciding to act in integrity with your own, um, your own values. Uh, you wrote, and, and I underline this so I remember it, remember that having inner rules that don't agree with your outer actions is the single most damaging event that it can occur inside your personal sphere. I thought that was just such a powerful statement. Yeah, and I did, I did talk a lot about the spheres of influence. And what I tend to uh, experience is that people have what I call spheres of influence that tend to control our behavior and the, the society around us or the social norms push us to conform. You know, growing up Catholic, that whole business of 
all you again, you know, sex before marriage was a big deal. You just didn't do it. You didn't cross that line. Or, you know, if you grew up in a very strong Italian family, maybe you were expected to marry an Italian guy. Or military families tend to marry other military families. I mean, you know, those kinds of culture pressure do exist. And it's hard for people to stay in their power and follow what they're getting is internal belief systems and guidance. But if you find yourself with fear, the number one thing you can do is say out loud or softly to yourself, I feel the fear. What is the fear trying to tell me? And the fear is like a FedEx messenger. The fear will tell you what its message is. And the message could be based on some belief system. Let's say my mother was a redhead and I'm a red, let's say I'm a redhead too. And she never wore red or orange. And I'm looking at this orange dress and I'm thinking it looks really good on me. But my mother never wore those colors. I probably shouldn't. That's based on an old belief system from my family that doesn't fit for me. So I can look at that and go, okay, now I understand why I'm afraid to buy that beautiful dress that I think looks really good on me. So I look at that and I set that aside and say, okay, that was my mother's belief. She's entitled to that belief, but I'm choosing otherwise. But then there might be something else, like um, I had my colors done and they told me turquoise is the best color for me. I'm looking for a turquoise dress so that when I walk in that room for this big party, I look sensational. That's a choice. And then, then this orange dress isn't the right one because it doesn't mm-hmm. reflect a choice I made, a decision yeah. I made. So sometimes the fear is based upon real necessary things, like... In my case, I had fear over buying something because I hadn't yet paid my electric bill. My electric bill came up. I was filled with all this fear. And I couldn't figure out why a $50 bill was really setting me off until I asked the fear what it was trying to tell me. And it showed me the electric bill side by side by the jacket I had bought. And at the moment I saw it, I recognized the fear was showing me that I was out of integrity with my stated goals and desires of balancing my budget and providing for my family. At that moment, I made a decision to always have my bills paid and to have money set aside for luxuries so that I could buy something when I wanted to and I wouldn't have to worry or wonder Mm -hmm. where I was for the rest of the system. So fear is always a messenger. Now, you, we talked about creating this movie that you run in your head that you call a genie movie. And you kind of fuel it with uh, emotion. But um, life tends to keep on intervening. Tell us what a divinity test is. Uh, Well, a divinity test is the opportunity to discover how really good you are at what you're doing. Most people, when they're starting to learn manifestation, get pretty good at it. They have a few successes. And then they hit a brick wall. And that's your divinity test. Now, early on, I understood this concept. And I asked in meditation what to call it. And I was told, call it the divinity test because it's God asking you if you believe in you as much as God does. And it's all the support mechanisms are gone. You feel like the rug has been pulled out from under you. And you have no one to turn to that is part of your system to, to make it happen. And you have to let go and then trust that it'll come back together. So the letting go is very powerful because you're not letting go because you failed. You're letting go because you don't know what the solution is in this exact moment. But you're clear that you're going to stay with it as long as you can. And I, I speak of a number of divinity tests in the book and how... They play out. Well, now, trust is such a difficult thing to achieve, Um, either trusting the universe to provide you with what you need or trusting yourself, you know, trusting yourself to to follow through, uh, believing that you're worthy of getting it. How do you overcome these kind of trust barriers? Well, this is why I said in the beginning that initially you do not have to know or understand or even believe in the system. You just have to follow the steps. 
And then your experience shows you that you're on target. And then mm -hmm. when you get to that place where you're having a divinity test and you, you let go, you're clear, you know, I thought I was supposed to do this, but if I'm not, you know, so be it. And I'm going to do everything I can, but I'm like backing off a little bit. So you're unhooking your um, emotional charge. I have to have it this way. And what happens is the universe then rushes in to fill it the way it can. And there are so many examples of this throughout life. Um, and I'll give you an example where I had presented this material for the first time to a big conference. You know, I was one of the many big breakout rooms. And my goal was to fill the room and did not have anyone leave. And that happened the first year. We had over 100 people in the room. The second time, I'm nervous because I realized what I did. And I wonder, am I going to be able to pull that off again? I had a really rough year. I had a, a family member who was sick, and I was spending a lot of time nursing that person. And I wasn't putting as much thought or preparation into this presentation, even though I was asked back. And now the day of the event, I'm a little anxious, and I'm you know, starting to poke through my papers and see if there's something there for me to improve my performance or refresh it or something. And I'm on this bus that's going all over town. I'm in the cheapest hotel, you know, and it's stopping at every one of the hotels to get us to the convention center. So this lady works her way to the back of the bus. It's already super crowded, standing room only. She gets to the seat next to me, which I finally cleared out my papers. She looks at me and she said, can I sit here? And I said, of course. And as soon as she sat down, she looked me in the eye. She pointed her finger at me and she said, I know you. You're the lady who gave that lecture. And she proceeds to tell me about my lecture and how it changed her life. Hmm. In that moment, that synchronicity let me know that even though I was terrified I would fail a second because, you know, maybe that first time was a fluke. That moment was the universe showing me, at a girl, you're fine, everything's fine. Hmm. And so the way you know is when you let go, the universe will give you a signal of some sort, some synchronicity that will alert you and show you what next step to take or that it's being handled. And maybe not the way you thought, but it's being handled. Now, let you, you have divided the book into two parts. The first part is kind of a how-to, the steps and the genie process. But the second part kind of goes back and explains the science behind it. You know, why, uh, I guess, for us left-brain types, uh, why you should believe in the validity of this process because of natural laws and so forth. Um, why did you decide to put the, the how-to first and then the science afterwards? This is a really great question. When the book was written, it was the other way around. And I was adamant, you have to understand the science to make this work. And I was a purist through and through, determined that people understand the math and the science, and then everything else would follow. And over the course of time, it became more and more apparent that what was really needed was to get people to get their feet wet, to practice these principles. And then if they wanted to learn about the science, they could, because you could apply this, these tools and these concepts without understanding why, just like you can you know, use a computer without understanding programming. But I also felt there would be a lot of people who were logical types who would want and benefit from understanding the principles. And what's really funny is it wasn't until I got into those later edits, probably the second last one, that I finally uh, realized the need for um, putting the principles in the back so that people could finally recognize that there was something powerful undergirding it. And by, the time, by that time, they would have had some successes. They would have had a little bit of experience with the 
the tools and how to use them. And then they would look at the undergirding. Now, one of the biggest reasons that the principles are important is because those of us who have a very strong, logical way of looking at things, and, and frankly, most people in the West use their logic way more than they use their intuition. So once you have this undergirding of logic on why these principles are valid and why they work, it gets the yes but out of the way. For example, once you recognize that the, the formula is foolproof and works every single time, your logical brain can't take it away from you because it's a done deal. You've, you've added it up. You've proven it to yourself. That's very powerful. So it gets a lot of the energy of doubt to just evaporate because it doesn't need to be there. Why do we doubt? We doubt to be safe. We doubt to make sure that we don't make a mistake. And it's the ego trying to help us to achieve our outcomes. And when we use logic to prove a principle, then doubt has no need to be there. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was very struck on the science part in your discussion of chaos theory and fractals, you know, how fract and, and how the, um, the, the phi sequence, uh, goes both, uh, the, the reciprocal goes infinitely smaller and the, the phi goes infinitely bigger in a logical orderly fashion. So when I was looking at the fractals and, and conceiving that whole uh, relationship, I realized that that is what is meant by um, the principle of Toth, as above, so below. Yes. And that's another huge piece. People love fractals. They're beautiful. They're interesting. But when you look at fractals, you always see that curve. That's the phi ratio curve, and it shows up. And when you start to look at it, it's that same curve that you see in the Paisley print, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the curve you see in a lot of designs, and it's found in the music staff of the bass clef, for example, those of you who know music. And so this curve in the fractal shows us something. And when you begin to comprehend that mathematically that can be produced and move in both directions and expand or contract, it's mm. remarkable. You know, there's, yeah, there's so much behind this that's like, wow. Oh, yeah, well, um, people, you have to read the book. But um, Maureen, what is the one maybe single most important thing you want to, to leave with my listeners? I'd like to give them the opportunity to recognize that the power of the spoken word and the power of their thought and idea is so miraculous that it can change their life. So I don't know how much time, time we have. If I only have a half a second, I'm just going to do the short version. If I have a little longer, I'll do the long version. Oh, go longer. Okay. So the principle is based upon a real experience that I had where I came off of a plane and accidentally used a word that I never, ever use in conversation. And I ran into the airline employee, he said, how are you doing? And I was getting ready to, I was flying all night, and then I was going to come back, be home for three hours, and then get on a plane and go to the East Coast. It was a very tight schedule. When she asked me how I was doing, I said, well, this is my day from blank because i am got to get back here in three hours. And she kind of gave me a quizzical look because it wasn't a very... It wasn't a very cool thing for me to have said. And I realized what I had done, and I was so wanting to fix it, I did the exact opposite and said, well, I'm having a day of heaven on earth because I'm flying with United. And that day I came home, and there was a flood in my basement caused by a pipe that was burst between the walls. Everything got resolved. The plumber came. My neighbor came to watch the plumber. I was able to change out my suitcase. The airlines let me reschedule my flight. Everything fell into place. I'm now on the plane 
looking around, thinking to myself, how did I pull that off? And immediately I was told, you asked for a day of heaven on earth. <laughs> so the next three times that I had a lot going on, I asked for that day of heaven on earth. By the third time, everything was so magical that I thought, you know what? I can ask for this for every single day, and so can you. Wow. <laughs> okay, a takeaway so the, tool. The, the way I do it is I say I'm asking for a day of heaven on earth for me and everyone I come in contact with. I echo that sentiment. Maureen, what is your website? MaureenStGermain.com uh, That's Saint S-T? Yes, so it's M-A-U-R-E-E-N-S-T-G-E-R-M-A-I-N.com. Maureen St. Germain, author of Be a Genie, Create Love, Success, and Happiness. Maureen, thank you very much for being with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Miriam. Remember that you can find all the books that we discuss here on NCR Radio on our website, ncreview.com, as well as lots, lots more. Well, I do hope you'll join us next week when our guest will be Trenace Rose. She has a visually and spiritually gorgeous book out called The Akashic Alphabet. And now we're going to close with our track of the week. This week we have a beautiful song by Laura Berman called Voices.
These are our voices from the album Everything in Between by the lovely Laura Berman. Laura's website is laurabermanmusic.com. Well, I guess that's our show for today. I hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Miriam Knight for New Consciousness Review. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>